Well, it just kind of began like, just like any ambush uh, with enemy initiating, initiating contact, but I remember it still to this day. I can, you know, I can hear what it was, you know, remember the temperature in the air, what it smelled like, but it was, that's like, as we were walking down the trail, down in the valley, you heard a single one shot and two shots, and then just the whole valley erupted, and then RPGs and you know, fully automatic fire came in from seemed like every direction. Right as you know the the valley erupted, you know, as we're trained to do, we return fire. And so I remember I went to my first magazine as fast as I could. You know, I just picked a spot on the hill where I thought, hey, that's where I would be, and um, I fired my first magazine, I loaded another one, as soon as I loaded another one it was lights out. And uh, yeah, talking to Kane, what had happened was it just landed right behind my head. And so it was very early on, within the first probably 30 seconds of the fire coming. Um, I was face down on a rock that was kind of, you know, buried in the trail. And as I picked my head up, uh, enemy round came in and hit that rock just inches from my face and then kind of just fragmented into my face. The way that we were moving, like I was in the headquarters element because I was a radio telephone operator. So we were kind of in the middle of patrol with the ANA to our back and then the rest of the American forces to the front. And so what had happened was there was this little tiny like outcropping of rocks that came from the cliff above and that kind of just made a little point in the trail. And so as the fire kicked off, that kind of separated the, the patrol in two. And so after you know the initial shots, I didn't see the rest of the, the patrol. So after I kind of got my bearings together, after, you know, uh, RPG, I looked over my shoulder and I could see Kane running down the trail just towards like this little treetop. Basically it was just, you know, the, like the, the canopy of a tree. And it wasn't providing any cover from like the incoming rounds, but just concealment. And he was running towards that and I could see he was just kind of like, his right arm was just kind of dead. And, and uh, he had blood coming from his upper right arm, and so I, I saw that, and I just moved to him. I just figured that's where I need to be, and then uh, went down there, and I looked at his, you know, wound on his shoulder, and I put a tourniquet on his upper right arm. Yeah, so um, I worked on Kane for a little bit to make sure he was, you know, okay, and I was returning fire, and Kane told me that box had been hit, and so I looked back up to the trail from where we were coming from, and I could see box. Still sitting up, holding his weapon, but he had been shot in the leg and then his upper left shoulder, and I could see you know some blood coming from his mouth. So I knew he was pretty severely wounded, and I was yelling at him, you know, uh, you know, use all your strength, try to get to me because there's still a lot of fire coming in, and it's probably you know not even five ten seconds, but he wasn't making any progress, and so I decided you know to get up and go to him and try to pull him back to where we were, and then so as I as I ran out there and grabbed him, I started dragging him by the carry handle, and I noticed that, you know, they weren't, before I ran out to him, there was, there was rounds coming in around us, but none of them were focused on him, but when I ran out there, it seemed like, you know, all the fire was focused on us, and, you know, I kind of came to the conclusion that they, they weren't trying to hit box, but they were trying to shoot at me, and so I knew if the longer I dr drug him and they focused their fire on me, the greater chance of him getting hit again was. And so what I did was just kind of drag him like five, ten feet, you know, or something like that, and then run back to where Kane was, just to kind of draw their fire and have them follow me and leave him alone. And so, you know, I'd run back to Kane's position, wait just a few seconds until he get distracted, and then repeat the movement until we got back to Kane, you know, behind the concealment of the tree canopy. And then from there, when I got him to that location, I put Trank it on his leg and then you know, put a field dressing on his left shoulder and then you know you don't they train you not to stop at just that you know you want to keep evaluating make sure there's no other injuries and when I was doing that I found an exit wound on his his rib cage lower rib cage on the right side and uh, it was bleeding you know obviously some artery had been hit so I tried to just control the bleeding as much as I could but he ended up dying. By the time I saw him, I noticed just I could the way the trail was shaped. I could just see his helmet and then his assault pack, but I couldn't actually see like him laying there. And so I just wanted to go see what the issue was and go see if he's okay. And then I didn't really run out to there because he was kind of at that outcropping I mentioned. 
and that's where a lot of fire was still coming in. So I more like you know high crawled, low crawled out there to him, and uh, I checked his pulse, and he had already died. Initially, you know after that the RPG and everything, I, I told myself I was going to die. You know there's no doubt in my mind I was not going to make it off of that cliff that day, and so in my mind that for the rest of the time it was you know if I am going to die I'm going to try to help you know my battle buddies until that happens, and then so throughout the time, you know, you're just following back on your training, you know, the movements you do, you know, the first aid, that's all what's been pounding in your head, you know, training up to deploy. And so really it was just kind of muscle memory going through the things. You don't really think about what you're doing, you just know that they have to be done. And you also know that if the roles were reversed and it was you that was sitting out there, you know, your battle buddy would come and get you. It was, uh, my radio and Kane's radio had already been shot at the beginning of the ambush, so those radios were dead. And it was actually Sergeant Box's radio. I went back to his, um, like his kit he still had, and tried to see if his radio was working. And so I was pulling the, the hand mic off of his kit, like up to my head, it just, it just got, it just flew out of my hand. And it wasn't, you know, I didn't quite understand what that was. And I picked it up and again, it was a bullet hole clean through it. And I was just like, really? You know, it was kind of the, you know, just that moment where you're just like, come on. Um, since I was a radio telephone operator, I was pretty trained on those, so I was able to just switch it to use, it's called side key mode, so it's basically you just talk like a walkie-talkie, and then so I was able to start relaying reports back to our base. What I was doing is, like, helping our commanders, like, understand the situation, like, where everybody was and where the enemy was, so it's kind of... I wasn't directly like calling them in, but I was guiding them like, hey, this is where you need to be, this is where the enemy's at, you know, stuff like that. At one point, um, a mortar round landed, you know, our mortar round landed uh, about 20 meters down the trail from us, so it was, uh, I remember that pretty distinctively, because uh, you know, I heard just a hiss right before it hit, and then the explosion, and I remember just red hot chunks of metal like the size of my, my palm just flinging by your head and it was, it was, I think as nightfall we still have that kind of, we see in the night and they can't, that, that advantage. But it was something I was worried about, you know, I was, you know, the old, only able-bodied American at my position and trying to cover 360 in the middle of the war zone and you get that, you get that very lonely feeling out there and that was definitely a concern of mine. But I knew there's so much, you know, you can look up and see the, the you know, the aircraft that are overhead watching you, so you had a, some sort of sense of security as well. Towards the end of the ambush, Kane had been shot again in the leg, and I put you know, a belt on his leg as a tourniquet. And so as nightfall became, or excuse me, as nightfall came, uh, my focus was kind of keeping him awake and alert because you know a lot of our medical kit stuff was damaged, so it's kind of just trying to keep him with it, keep him positive, reassuring him. And as the a and Afghan National Army began to come back, that's when I was like, all right, you know, these guys can't see at night, but I can at least tell them, you know, what to do. And so I set them up in the security perimeter on the two ends of the trail. And it's like, you know, hey, I know you can't see, but if I see, you know, enemy, I'll initiate contact. You guys just fire in the same direction, you know. So it's kind of establishing security and kind of keeping Kane alert and stuff. That was my main focus. Well, it started at 5.30, or 3.30 in the afternoon, and it lasted till nightfall. So I think it was about, it was close, close to four hours. And, and then after, as nightfall came, then they kind of, you know, broke contact.